work we've done uh, at Stanford University with Janet Chang and James Lambe, and we had a collaborator from Inri Alil, Thomas Piedzak, was here over there. So this is a work we did last year, and actually the talk before was a perfect introduction for it, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> so uh, we started looking at uh, vibrations and how we use wearables. And one thing is we use visual uh, feedback all the time. So if you think about it, here we have a person who's looking down at his phone and biking, and what happens? It crashes. And you know, it sounds funny, but it happens. And if we were using vibrations, maybe that would be better for him. Now if we look at the same person here, he's in a meeting, and he's doing a subtle gesture to get some feedback from his phone, and basically he's getting vibration as feedback. So in both situations, one case is dangerous, the second it's rude, but in both situations we may want to use haptics instead of using visual feedback. And then we looked at when do we actually uh, use haptics feedback at the moment. So uh, mostly on wearables and on our phones when it vibrates. So we were thinking, okay, what about wearables? So people mostly use wearables for fitness tracking. So we started with this. You know, we said, okay, let's see how haptic does in that situation, in that context. If you think about, um, sorry, if you think about uh, visual feedback in um, in fitness trackers, if you want to do something like behavior change with people, right now what we have to do, let's think about a Fitbit, is you have to actively think about how well you are doing with your step count, and then you actually have to pull the information and check it yourself on your phone. So we were thinking, well, actually, can we use ambient vibration feedback and just get vibrations throughout the day and do better? And when we started to think about it, we realized a lot of the work on vibration is looking at pretty complex systems where we have uh, up to six actuators, for example, around the wrist, giving you very complex signal. But we don't know really how much information we can give with one simple actuator. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to describe how we designed the vibration feedback language that gives a number uh, 1 to 10. So this is for 10% to 100% towards a goal. And then I will show you how we validated it uh, in two lab studies in a month-long institute study. And I'll argue that the 90% uh, recognition rate that we achieved is actually useful for communicating progress in behavior change scenarios. So let's have a look at those wearable devices. So that's what I said. They're basically made as small as a, and as cheap as possible. So we end up with a very low resolution actuator. And we have to work with that. And that was really the question we asked. What can we do with that single actuator that has one intensity? Like, how far can we go with it? Can we actually do something? Is it sufficient for us to actually uh, communicate goal progress? So in order to do that, we went back to our pencils and we decided to, de uh, to design uh, several signals. So I'm not going to go through all of them, and you don't have to read that old table. But basically, we were looking, okay, so the only thing we can modify is how many times I'm sending a signal, so very much what we said. The only thing we can control is how long is the vibration and how many vibrations we can send, and that's it. That's as much control as we get. So then what we did is we had two lab studies. I'm going to show you a short video. So here we have a visual representation of one signal that helped us understand what the signal uh, looked like for the user, for the participant. And then the participant would basically feel the vibration and tell um, the experimenter what they felt. So during the study, they didn't have the sheet of paper, but it's just to show you. And in that case, we get 96% accuracy. So it's actually really good. So our highest signal gets 96% accuracy. This is what the signal looks like. So it's actually inspired by a Roman numeral system. It's our winning design in many ways. And the way it works is you have one single short vibration that gives you number one, two single vibrations, number two, three and four the same way. And five is a longer vibration. So then we have five plus one, so a long and a short for six, et cetera, all the way to 10, that is like two long vibrations, two fives. And uh, we actually had a couple of systems that did pretty well, but then this was preferred by 10 out of 12 participants in addition to doing really well in terms of accuracy. So we were very happy. We have this great system. We know that people can recognize number one to 10. We can do something with it. We're very excited about it. But then that was in the lab. And you know, in the lab, people are happy. They come for 20 minutes. It's quiet. Nobody's making noise. You know, it's always perfect. But then does it really work? Is it sustainable in the wild? And this is what we wanted to see. So how did we validate our study? So we ran this in-situ study for four weeks. And we recruited 22 participants. So we had a wide range of participants from 20 to 69 years old. We actually had three people in their 60s. And it was as successful with them as with everybody else. Uh, we had a slightly um, 
different compensation scheme in some ways because we didn't want to influence the way people were complying with the study, and that's something you can read in the paper. And people will receive up to 12 vibrations a day during the waking hours. So here is what it looked. Oh, and there were also two conditions. So we had a condition with a pre-signal telling people um, a long vibration first, saying, hey, you're going to get a vibration, pay attention, and another condition where people were just getting the number. So here is what it looked like. So we have this person here, and she's working at her desk, and while she's working, so it's uh, a normal day, she's just feeling this vibration, and she's answering a survey on the watch. And in that condition, so overall, and we're going to get through that in the talk, we get 89% accuracy in this type of situation. The person is working, they get the vibration, they answer to what they felt. So here is what it looked like. So it's actually a very simple interface on the watch that they could answer within a couple of seconds. So they're going to tell us either, yes, I felt the vibration, but I don't have time to attend to it. The second option is, yes, I felt it, or no, I didn't feel the vibration. So let's say they saw something happen on the watch, but they didn't feel anything. So here she's going to tell us, yes, she felt the vibration. She's going to tell us what number she felt. So here is going to be number four. She's going to give a level of certainty for it. So she's very sure. And then she's going to tell us what her activity was. So just a very simple way to gather the data. So first, let's talk about compliance. So we get 80% of the watch survey answered. This is really good, because most of the time when people weren't answering, they were either sleeping or under the shower, and we can't really force people to answer while they're asleep or under the shower. It doesn't feel fair to them. And you're not laughing, so I'm going to guess you're all sleeping. <laughs> so out of the 80%, so we have um, 4,600 data points. It means that we still had a ton of data of people just telling us, yes, I felt it, and here is what I felt. Uh, that was 93% of the time. We had 6% of the time people telling us, I felt it, but I can't attend to it right now. And then we had 1% of the time people saying, I didn't feel it. We also had a way to measure for phantom vibrations, and we found they were very uncommon in our study. And that was surprising. We expected way more of them, but it was actually only 11 points out of the whole thing. So now let's look at the activities and the accuracy. So this is um, the breakdown, the distribution of the different activities. So first of all, um, stationary, 67%. This is huge. I mean, we're in California. It's supposed like people are supposed to be active, you know? And we get 67% of the time people being sedentary. And to me, this is a really important result for three different reasons. So first, we have a high number of people with a sedentary lifestyle. So it's very good for behavior change. It's like, yes, we can do something because there is something to be done. Uh, second, people told us they felt bad about reporting that they were sedentary all the time, just from the self-report. Because even people that feel they're very active, they're only active for, what, two hours a day? Even if they go to the gym every day. So that was only two vibrations. So really, the rest of the time, they felt bad about it. Uh, the third time is, uh, I'm going to show you in a minute, that actually we do really well in terms of uh, recognizing the vibration when people are stationary. So it means it's a good time, and it's what happened most of the time. So it's really good. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I want to talk about driving. So we had a pilot study initially with 12 participants for a week, and we realized people were driving and doing our study, and we were not feeling very comfortable about it, and I don't think that was in our IRB either. So we told people, please do not put yourself in a dangerous situation to answer the study. But they still drove 7% of the time. That's a lot of time. And so I asked them afterwards, and I tried to figure it out. We told them not to do it, and they still did it. And basically, it's people who are already used to texting and driving. And it's not even that they use you know, other modalities. They text and drive. So we really need to think when we're building technology, how do we create input and output techniques that actually don't require people's visual attention because they are going to use it in situations that are not safe, even though we legislate about it. They're not supposed to do it, and they will get a ticket for it, but they still do it. So that's something to think about in the future. In terms of accuracy, so we actually get 89% in situ. So this is a lower bound because the numbers were uh, given in a random order. In the future, the idea is to build towards a goal so that we get one, like 10% uh, of the goal, 20% of the goal, 30% all the way to 100. So right now, in a random order, we got 89%. On top of that, if you look at the confusion matrix into, inside the paper, I didn't want to put it on screen because it's really, really hard to read those confusion matrix on the screen. But basically, people often mistook either like an 8 for a 9, for example, or 2 for a 3, or what happened is like a short for a long signal. So we can strengthen our signal by, for example, making the long signal slightly longer and not having those confusions anymore. 
So for lower bound, this is really good because this is a real activity. This is a real setting. People are working, people are driving, people are motorcycles, people are with their kids, and we still get these very high numbers. So uh, stationary did the best to 91%. And then most activities did pretty well, so um, 80 to 87% recognition. So when I'm saying recognition, it means that they uh, guessed the exact number that they were supposed to feel. And running did really poorly. And what we found is actually people feel the impact of running on the ground, and then they feel the watch, and they're not quite sure what happened. They're not really sure what they felt. Um, I think that can be solved by maybe increasing the... Um, the power of the of the vibration so they can really feel what's happening but right now this system as we designed it so it was on a pebble watch is not the right one for running as it is the other thing we found that was really interesting is something about social context so beside uh, sleeping and showering the other situation when people decided to either not answer or they had a hard time to really uh, report an accurate number was when they were talking to someone and um, we found that the social uh, context had a very high impact on the recognition rate and the user comfort. People would say, oh, I was with friends, and you know, just like doing it triggered a conversation. But sometimes they would say, I was giving a talk, and it vibrated, and I lost my train of thought, and that was really hard. So it was really hard for people to do that. So this co social context has an impact and is really important to take into account. If we think of the way we design, um, we, we try to find context. Right now, we're really thinking about a physical activity context. We're not really thinking about the social context. So when we design interfaces to go with wearable devices, we should not only look at using gyroscopes, for example, and accelerometers, but we should maybe also look at the sound and how many people are talking, and is that a good time to send a vibration? So we really need to mix these sensors about both activity but also social context together. So in conclusions, we found that different vibration patterns could be recognized from a single actuator. They could be recognized with a high accuracy, a low mental demand, and they were not disturbing to people. So even though it was up to 12 times a day, that did not disturb them. We found that the physical activity mattered, but the social context mattered too. Uh, just something very quickly about the pre-signal. So we really thought the pre-signal would make a difference, and we didn't find any significant difference in the results in terms of accuracy. What happened is people told us that they liked it. They liked having it. People who didn't have it, we told them, do you think that would have been um, helpful? And they said, yeah, that would have been nice. So we're just going to say for now that it's not necessary, but it could be helpful. In terms of future work, so now what we want to do is actually do something with behavior change. So now we know that people can actually feel those vibrations and that uh, we know when is a good time to give uh, these vibrations. So now what we want to do is to compare uh, visual input with a vibration output and see how well that does. We also want to think about different type of activities. It could be fitness, but it could also be uh, how many hours a day you are practicing a musical instrument, how many hours a week. And that could be different ways of looking at behavior change as well. And we also want to look at non-visual input. How do we give a non-visual input and a non-visual output that can work for the person? Um, so basically, I showed you how we designed the vibration feedback for the numbers 1 to 10, so representing 10 to 100 percent. Uh, we validated our work both in the lab with two different studies, but also in a month-long study in situ with 22 people. We have a 90 percent recognition rate overall, and we believe that the recognition rate will be useful for communicating uh, progress in behavior change scenarios. So vibration for us is a promising mechanism for progress monitoring. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Don. I'm from MIT. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm curious, why didn't you use Morse code to teach the users how to count and uh, how to sense? Yeah, because it's, it's hard. You need to teach people. That, well, that's very much what it is. We didn't want to teach. We want something that could just be deployed right now with the system we have. Right now, the learning system that we uh, put in place, because we wanted everybody to have the same uh, learning uh, opportunity was they would feel the, si the signal one to ten twice in a row with a visual um, support. Yeah, but, but, but that's very limited. Like if you want to send I the know. whole alphabet, you want to like but we're not trying to like. No, I, I totally agree. We're not trying to send an alphabet. But we're trying to see how we can support users just through that progress. And that's why one to ten was enough of a resolution. If we want to do more, we'll have to be a more complex system. And Morse code is a way of doing it. But Morse code takes learning into account. 
not everyone can do Morse code. If we had taken experts in Morse code, maybe for them it would have been very easy to translate from what they know of Morse code into the, uh, the physical sensation. Maybe not. I don't even know like how well that would translate. But then if we take people who are non-expert, that's pretty hard. We also have a very wide population. We had five people over 50. We had three people over 60. I don't know how hard of a learning curve that would have been. With this system, they could right away start to use it. And it was, it was key to us to have something that they could start using right now with the type of devices they have right now. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Jessica. Hi. Tillman from Uni Stuttgart. Um, great work. I was wondering, you said it was um, not disturbing. Yes. Um, did you look into how much more interruptive it was, though, yes. to kind of focus on a specific pattern rather than just a short vibration that might I might be able to ignore while I'm reading something? Yes. So we didn't look specifically in the interruption. But what we did is at the end of the day, we asked them how much they felt interrupted, uh, how much they felt disturbed by, what the, by, by the vibrations. And we found most of the time they didn't find it disturbing. The times where they found it disturbing would be they would be in a meeting room and like let's say the hand was on the table and it started vibrating and the whole table, like the noise would go through the table and they would be like, oh my gosh, everybody could like listen something happen. Or they would say, one person was saying that they were on the couch was watching a horror movie with their spouse mm -hmm. and then the watch vibrated and she got really scared and it was like she was so upset at me for doing that study at that moment. So I think it was very like specific moments where something happened and they felt it was like, ooh. But otherwise, I think they got pretty accustomed to it. And the only few times would be like, I was very focused on a really hard problem and I was thinking about it and it vibrated and that disturbed me. But I don't think it's any more disturbing than when your phone would be ringing. For did example. you have the feeling that people had to concentrate in that moment to actually get the pattern? So it really, from what, from the feedback we got from them. So it was really when they were talking to someone mm. that the concentration thing came in. So I don't know if it's because it doesn't occur on the other situation or if it's because it doesn't disturb them as much so they don't feel they had to concentrate. That's something that's hard to discriminate for me at this point. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Suzanne Oldenburg. Um, and just a question about the um, the work. It's a very nice work on the frame of reference. So you decided yes. for the 10. Yes. Was there a demand also of having like an end in the sense of saying that even if I'm not so sure if this was the 10, its system says, okay, we've done with because we've also done other experiments and they often show sort of you can monitor progress, but it's also nice to have an emphasis of saying, okay, you've done it, for example, you yes. finished something. Was it's there a demand? True. So right now we only looked at when, you know, when was a good time to send the vibration, if it disturbed people, if people could like discriminate between the vibration. So because they had them in the random order, it wasn't associated to their activity. When we're going to want to associate it to an activity, the end thing may be really important because then it's like, is 10 the end or is it 10 plus something is happening? So if 10 is the end, it really needs to be a signal that signifies the end and that can't be mistaken for something else. At the same time, because it will be a growing signal, like they will get 8, 9, and then 10, I think they will most likely recognize 10 as the end spot. Okay. And, and then a tiny other question is sure. if, you, if you are running this... Um to support like the progress of certain certain actions, do you think you can, um, let's say, overlay it? So, how, what, what happens if you have two applications that want to do it? Uh, and that's a really not. good question. I think it would be. It's difficult, it's challenging, but that's what's interesting. It's like, could I just give you a pre-signal that says, hey, that's application one, and yeah. that's activity one, eh? and another pre-signal that's slightly different, telling you, hey, that's about uh, activity two. We have to try. We totally have to try. This okay. is going to be fun, actually. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Hi. Hi, Jessica. I'm Ichi from National Taiwan University. And I want to say that this is a, a great work, but I'm curious about uh, your potential application because currently your system can send only numbers mm -hmm. from 1 to 10. And yes. I'm curious about uh, how do you, uh, what's the uh, potential usage? And are you planning to send more complex? message. So this one was very much about looking at progress and how I'm telling people how well they are doing towards a goal. So right now that's why we went 1 to 10, which again was 10% up to 100% of the goal. When we want to discriminate with more numbers, maybe the signal is not the right one. But at least now we know that people can recognize up to 10 different signals um, accurately and that the number of times they were receiving the vibration was not disturbing to them overall. 
um, if we want to do something different, we may have to design something different for that too. Okay. Thank you for your answer. Thank you.